This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. My three lecture series. So let's just begin by recalling where we were at the end of the last lecture. So the main uh, idea we had found was that normally you would think a bound state of strings and brains might have a size like Planck length or string length, but actually that is not so. In principle, the size can also grow with the number of particles in the bound state. And first we start with simple estimates, and then we actually did calculations of making these bound states explicitly one by one. And in every case, you find that the bound state size is actually growth with the number of uh, objects in the bound state in such a way that the diameter of that is comparable to the Schwarzschild radius. And in fact, when you go to the specific constructions of these bound states one by one, then you find that uh, we had done the two charged states last time. They, there are actually no horizon. The horizon doesn't form. And we just saw that uh, st these, uh, once you have these extended objects of string theory, you get a new kind of physics that you did not have with novel particles, that when these objects bind in certain ways, they generate these fractional tension objects. And so then the more the brains you have, the lower the effective tension of the effective objects you make, and then the further they can stretch. And now you can see that uh, you actually have something new to say about black holes in the sense that now the size can grow. And indeed, when you go and make those bound states one by one, you find that's actually exactly what is happening. So the way we had started was we first looked at the two charge state. NS1 was just the fundamental string, and P meant momentum. So if we wrap the string on some circle of length L and wind it N1 times, uh, and then we give it NP units of momentum on that circle, well then, if you open up that string to its covering space, it has a total length N1 times L, and the momentum is then carried as traveling waves. And then there's an entropy coming from these traveling waves, and that explains the entropy count for this particular state. But then when you actually want to see the actual geometry is created by all these states, because the string has to move in some transverse direction, it has no longitudinal modes, when it has to move in some transverse direction to carry the momentum, it obviously spreads in size. And because it spreads in size, instead of getting something which is point-like, giving some kind of a geometry like this, you actually get something spread out, and it actually gives you some shape, but actually no horizon in the end. And you can see different states actually have different structures. And so you get exactly what you would have liked. You get uh, just something like a different planet for every particular microstate. Okay? And so as we just was just saying, you don't actually get a horizon. It's also important that you don't get spherical symmetry, which is why even though string theory and its low energy supergravity also and all the other things were known for a long time, uh, these states had not been discovered. Because normally, if you want to solve a complicated equation, you just put a spherically symmetric answer and see what it gives you. But in fact, then you wouldn't find these states. You have to actually go on and make them uh, from first principles directly. And then if you go to the size of the generic state, then you find, if you want to see how big it is, uh, interestingly, it comes out to have a diameter of the order of the uh, horizon. So even though there's no horizon, there is something, some role for this surface area to play. Because if you compute A by G, uh, it does give you a size which is the same as the order that you would have expected for a horizon. So in that sense, things sort of tie up. There is no horizon, but there is a ball-sized region, which you call a fuzzball, uh, which has the whole information. And that is a horizon-sized object. OK, then that changed our picture for how the things would evolve. In the vacuum, if the horizon was a vacuum, it just produced entangled pairs from the stretching of modes near the horizon. But now that you don't actually have a horizon but have some complicated structure, as you go to more complicated fuzzballs, you just see the information getting more and more uh, corrupted inside, the evolution getting more and more corrupted inside here. And so the modes being emitted carry the information of what's here, just the, the way they would do uh, for a piece of coal. OK, so that's where we were last time. And now I want to move on to working with these three charge states. And a lot of people have worked on that. I got just a few of those names down there. So the, what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 10 minutes or so would involve the work of many people who have helped to put together this picture. So let's just begin somewhere. How do we get to more complicated black holes? For the black holes made from just two charges, NS1 and P, the extremal black holes, the whole story has been completely solved. So in fact, for these very tiny black holes, you might say that we completely understand how everything is resolved. But of course, these are only very simple black holes, and they are sort of so small that they are on the threshold of being black holes. So you would rather like to deal with black holes which have more charges, which can be bigger. And so let's see if they also behave in the same way, that in their states, maybe they also don't have horizons. And then we can be sure that this picture is actually a good picture for everything. So we had learned about dualities the last time. You can take the string and do some dualities, maps of string theory, and it converts it into a D5 brain. But under the same dualities, the momentum we were placing on the string, it gets converted to a D1 brain. 
And so the bound state of NS1 and P actually becomes a bound state of D1 and D5 brains. But then we had seen just the way the momentum lying on a string, on a multi-wound string, became, com was coming in fractional units for a very simple reason. The whole string was long, so the momentum had to, uh, could be a wave which only closes after the whole string was over. So in fact, the momentum came in fractional units, but now we saw that it, when, one, uh, when uh, N1, D1 brains bind to N5, D5 brains, you get effectively N1, N5 fractional D1 brains. So we had a picture like this. But now when you have D1 brains like this, this, this many units of strings, you can join them up in various ways. You can break them into various groups like this. You can join them all into one long loop or have all these as separate uh, single loops or you know, some partitions of loops. So already before you do anything else with it, you can see that just for the D1 and D5 brains put together, there are many different states arising here. But that was to be expected because after all, that is just obtained by duality from the NS1P state. And if this one had many different states, where were those states? The different traveling waves. So when you back to the D1, D5 system, there should be it's the same number of states here. Duality is a symmetry. So where are all those states? Well, here they are. You simply have to take all the strings and join them up in various ways. So everything is very simple and pictorial with string theory. And you can see where the strings are. In fact, just that is what I just said in words is put mathematically on this slide. So this vibration profile, you can write as excitation of various harmonic mode. So alpha sub minus 1 means the lowest harmonic, alpha sub minus 2 means the next harmonic. You can put this n1 times, you can put this n2 times. The i1, i2 means the direction of polarization. You can vibrate this way, you can vibrate that way. So you can see this is a complete description of the vibration profile of the string at a quantum level. And after you do these dualities to go from NS1 and P to NS1 and NS, or to D1 and D5, then the, the map is very simple. If you had a mode which was alpha minus k, so you had a kth harmonic, it just gives you a string which is wrapped k times around here under the map. And uh, if it was in the direction i, a uh, polarization direction i, well that just becomes some kind of spin carried by this string. These strings actually carry a spin because of fermion zero modes. So if I draw a picture like this, there's a one-to-one -one map to what I'm actually doing here. And here the constraint was that if I take k units, nk units of the kth harmonic, well all this has to equal the total amount of units of momentum I have on the long string. But here the constraint is the same. If I have nk units of strings which have k times wound around here, then the total winding should be n1, n5. So you can see it's exactly the same physics. So of course the physics could not have been different, but I'm just now conveying to you that if I take the d1, d5 system, it of course has to have the same number of states as the ns1p system. Here there were different oscillators, excitations of different oscillators. Here there are different ways of joining up the string, and they of course give the same count. So I drew this picture here because we'll be doing a lot of these pictures in the next slide onwards. Because let's first go and finish off what's the uh, geometry part of this. So for NS1 and P, when we made the metric, it came and you know, it gave us different shapes in here. And somewhere in there was the actual source of the string running around. So okay, there was a string source in there. When you do all the dualities to D1, D5, it's not going to have qualitatively different properties. This did not have a horizon. This won't have a horizon. So that's not surprising. Here, if you had a different state for every, uh, a different configuration or geometry for every state, we had a different geometry for every state here. But the one curious thing is, here there was a string source running around. If you go there, you could see a string. And you could ask under all the dualities, what does it become when you reach the D1, D5 system after all the duality maps? And it changes to an interesting object called the KK monopole. So it becomes a KK monopole cross a circle. So it's a KK monopole like placed all around a, around a circle. So KK monopole cross S1 or a KK monopole tube. And so just, let me just remind you what a KK monopole is. So you remember we had a list of all the elementary objects in string theory. You had the graviton, then some strings and brains. But one of them was the kaluza klein monopole. And this is actually just a smooth topological knot in space time. There's no source, no singularity, just a solution of Einstein's equations but there's, with no source, and it's completely smooth, but has a non-trivial topology. So in fact, in string theory, sometimes you say, hey, I'm using some properties of string theory, and I'm seeing strings and brains. I can just do a duality map, just symmetry map, and say, hey, I'm seeing it as a topology of space-time. So when I say I'm going to use non-trivial properties of strings, I could either be seeing non-trivial topology or seeing brains. I can permanently talk about them. And here's an example of that that has happened to us. Here we had a string source, and here we're just seeing some kind of a knot in space-time, but otherwise it's a smooth space-time. So in fact, Richkov went back and quantized all these. You can take the family of geometries you get here. Now, actually, they have, don't even have a source. You can quantize them, uh, quantize the space of these geometries. And when you quantize them, you actually get the correct entropy uh, to, to root two pi root n1 and n5. So the whole entropy comes up by quantizing it. So in fact, 
we would say that for the two charge system, we now understand everything. In every duality frame, NS1P or D1, D5, we can just make all the solutions. The classical level, you can just make them as you know, solutions and you can then quantize them uh, by uh, some methods and then you can get the correct counter states and so everything is fitting together. Okay, so now we have to really move on to three charge states because there were, that's where new things might happen. And we, what we'll find in the end, the qualitative picture remains the same, but a lot more interesting things to learn. So what's the most general three charge state you could ask for? So now I have D1, D5, but we said we'll also put the momentum P along it. So I've drawn that as little uh, momentum modes over here, carrying vibrations. And so I can firstly partition the string in different ways. We already talked about that. And I can put different amounts of momentum and different harmonics on these different strings. And if I can find what all these things give on the gravity side, I have made all the states of the three charge D1, D5, P, extremal black. If I want to be non-extremal, I also want to have extra energy and the black hole should then be have a temperature and be able to radiate. I can put some of the vibrations going one way and some of them going the other way. Then their uh, momentums cancel and then the, but the energy doesn't cancel. That's non-extremal and these can collide and the energy can come out the way we were talking yesterday. Yes, there was a question. How do you know which objects should be in string theory? Yeah, so there actually there is really no choice. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, for example, if I have D1, D3, D5 brains here, I can't, for example, stick in a D2 brain here. Okay. And the point is, all this actually comes from the theory. If I try to take any one object out or one more ob put one more object in, the theory becomes inconsistent. So how are these D brains found? You just start first with the elementary string, and you try to see if you quantize the elementary string, it forces you to be in 10 dimensions. But it's also supersymmetric, and when you take the supersymmetric string theory, you find it has some natural boundary conditions where it can end on some D brains. But then you find that the supersymmetric conditions don't allow you to end in uh, the uh, even D brains, but only allow you to end in the odd D brains. So just playing with the elementary string and seeing the consistency of the elementary string gives you both the critical dimension and also gives you all the brain content. Yes? Uh, just to clarify, so I was just asking uh, what about how we know uh, which like, superstitions D1, D5, and D refer to the picture. Oh, in the construction. Okay, good. Yes. So the way that works is you choose those objects which are mutually BPS, which means they have mutually no force. So D1 and D5 have no force between them, but D1 and D3 do. So it turns out if I bind D1 and D3, the degeneracy doesn't actually rise. But if I bind D1 and D5, the, the degeneracy of states is root N1, N5. Whenever I choose a set of objects which are mutually BPS, that is they have no force between one and any other, other one, the entropy always becomes square root of this number of these, and number of these, and number of these, and number of these. Thank you for that question. That's very important. That's the general lesson we've learned from string theory, and all the black holes we've made in string theory all follow that pattern. Okay, so now we, if we can make these states and the non-extremal states, uh, the near-extremal states, then we'll generally have a picture of everything that's going on. So these are, there are a lot of states here, of course, and so the goal will be to try different corners of the space and see if we can do something. So the simplest one we started with first was, let's just put one excitation. You don't have to worry about what these things are. These are some descriptions of the states in the full D1, D5 conformal field theory, uh, and I haven't talked about the details, but there's some current operator, there's some twist operator which joins two strings. We apply some operator to this. In any case, in the end, we'll just look at it in pictures. If you put a vibration, a simple vibration on only one of the strings and nothing on the other ones, and align the spins of all these to be in the same, well then, if I didn't put this, I just had some kind of a geometry like this. Adding this turns out to just add a supergravity quantum which is localized here. Okay, so this is very, we just want to start somewhere. It wasn't obvious that you could do this because you had to solve some wave equation, and if you didn't have a smooth bound state solution, you would not get a dual of this, and you would actually get maybe a singularity or something. But in fact, there was a smooth bound state exactly of the correct energy, and then that's the dual description of this. Yes, question. Yes. And, and I can see it as a CFT that is on the D1 world model. model yes. So on the D1, D5 bound state, you take some D5 brains, you take some D1 brains, you bind them, you have some bind, bound state, and there's an effective CFT which helps you to understand that. We describe the dynamics of that bound state. Now we are looking at excitations of that, C, of that CFT, which means we are vibrating these D1s and D5 brains. So this is like a vibration of the D1, D5 bound state. So it's an excitation of the D1, D5 brain bound state, which you can say is an excitation of the D1, D5 CFT. Right? And so this is an excitation of the ground state of the D1, D5 CFT. Is that okay? Does that answer the question? Okay. So then we are just looking at various excitations, and if we can understand all the excitations, what they're doing on the other side, we have understood all the states. 
And so this one, we, we just began by understanding by, by some construction and we found the irrelevant boundary there. Well, that was just exciting one guy. So we were worried about if you excite all the guys, is there enough energy there to maybe collapse the whole thing and again make a horizon? The perpetual fear you have is if you do something and you back react properly, it will create a horizon in your theory will, will not be what, it, what you were trying to go. But it doesn't. In fact, for, the, for these states, when you excite them all the same way, uh, with again with some things called current operators, you actually also get some kind of a smooth geometry. And so we made this completely explicitly. You can do that as well. Okay. Then if you just take some string, one string and make it very heavily wound, but the other ones you leave them singly wound, and then you put an arbitrary excitation on this one, not the simple current ones, then using the PP wave formalism developed by uh, BMN, uh, Malmussen et al., you can take the, this formalism and you can actually find this time it corresponds to putting a string in this background. Okay, so slowly we're understanding corners of the space. You can just, you know, sometimes take many strings here, wind together, sometimes you take singly wound, but you put many of the excitations and so on. And you can also look at non extremal states where you have guys going up and guys going down, but the same excitation on each of them, the explicit state looks like this. There are some j's correspond to mo mo momentum going up and some j bars which correspond to momentum going down. Well, now we have both up and down, so this is a non extremal state. So it's very interesting because these guys can now collide and emit, and so we'll use them for Hawking radiation. Well, again, this time you can find a dual, there is no horizon, but interestingly, this thing actually has something called an ergo region. I'm going to come back to that because we're going to use this to understand how Hawking radiation comes out of first forms. Okay. So I, I want to tell you more about, uh, lots of these different corners have been made, but uh, it doesn't really help to do more of these pictures because I'm not actually showing the details of what all this is. But let me just say that this general program, it was initially pioneered, pioneered uh, by Bina and Warner, who have been written, writing lots of papers about this, but many other people have now joined the program. And they found large families of solutions. So let's just look at some qualitative properties of these solutions. They use many innovative techniques to do this. So they'll have things like Kaluza Klein monopoles, high, there's topological twists in space time. There'll be monopoles and anti monopoles hiding in various places. And uh, then between two monopoles, or a monopole and anti monopole, there are some topological S2s, just a property of the topology. And on these S2s are some fluxes. And that's how these things are stable and they don't collapse. If you have flux on a sphere, if you try to shrink the sphere, the energy rises because the flux is some n units, right? And it, so the field on it is, let's say, some n is, is something uh, on, on that sphere. If you collapse the sphere because the number of units of flux is fixed, the strength of the field has to go up. But the energy goes like f squared, and so the sphere doesn't want to shrink. So you can look at the solution and roughly see how these things are staying open. But now, just to understand in more detail, uh, how are all these things holding themselves together. We promised this last time that, okay, we have all these solutions, and even the non-extremal, which you think they have some uh, gravitational attraction because they have energy, why are they not just collapsing the way Bukdal theorem told us that it's very hard to keep anything up there? What is happening to Bukdal's theorem? So let's just take, make a toy model, uh, which will just under, help us to understand the first balls without actually going into detailed constructions of individual first balls. So for that, let's start with the three plus one dimensional Schwarzschild metric. So this, I guess, is familiar to all of you. The two GM, I have just called it R0, that's the radius of the horizon, okay? So if you do analytic continuation T to uh, minus I tau, then the dt square becomes d tau square and the sign here changes, so this is called Euclidean Schwarzschild. So you probably know what Euclidean Schwarzschild looks like. It actually ends at R equal to R0, so R actually doesn't go inside R0, and the geometry is like this. This, this uh, Euclidean time direction, you have to make it a periodic circle with this radius. So this is the Euclidean time direction tau. See, I have drawn it there. This is the radial direction. But as you come to the radius r naught, this thing actually smoothly caps off. You can see the size of the tau direction is going to zero when r becomes r naught. So the tau circle becomes smaller and smaller. And here it smoothly caps off like a cigar. Okay. So that's the geometry of Euclidean Schwarzschild. Of course, this thing is repeated all theta and phi. So theta and phi go around like this. Okay. So this is the Euclidean, Euclidean short shell. This region is not part of space time. You simply get, uh, let's say, a hole in space time. And so the picture here would be that you take this room, you cut a ball from the middle and throw it out. So that's not part of space time. And then you say, well, how can that be? When I come to that point, where will I go? I can't fall off the edge of space time. But no, when you have this extra circle, things are okay. Because suppose there was an extra circle everywhere in the world for us. As we come close to the boundary of the hole that you cut out, the circle shrinks, 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 and caps off like a cigar. Okay, so in fact, if you come to the edge of the hole, you won't fall off the edge of the world. It's a completely smooth manifold. You'll simply go back this way. Okay, so this is the Euclidean short shot geometry. And now what we'll do is, we'll, so if it, uh, let's just, uh, okay, so I'm not going to add one more time direction, but right now all I want to say is, I'm going to just do dimensional reduction on this. 
So I have a geometry now. I forgot to actually write that. I'm going to add a time direction. So I have these four directions, and I'll just add a minus dt square. That's also a solution of full Einstein's equations, but now there's a solution in four plus one dimensions. Okay. So now if I have a solution in four plus one dimensions, then uh, if I fluctuate the size of this compact dimension, for somebody who cannot resolve the compact dimension, it looks like a three plus one dimensional solution with, let's say, a gravitational wave propagating here with some kind of, if it's just a compact duration size which I'm fluctuating, it actually looks like a scalar field. And uh, so you just see a three plus one dimensional space time with a scalar field propagating. But in the full four plus one dimensions, what you have is that you're fluctuating the size of this circle. So that's just dimensional reduction. And uh, have you guys heard about that before? Okay. Well, we don't need too much of it, but uh, let's assume that we, we know what that is. And if you don't, it's okay. Uh, so the size of this compact dimension, the compact direction was called tau. So the size of that is given by g tau tau, and the scalar field phi is defined in terms of g tau tau by this formula. Okay, it's just, this is just algebra, but so you don't need to know what the numbers are, but you, the, the scalar field phi basically tells you how big the compact dimension is. So this is just the same thing rewritten out. Okay, so now the metric in three plus one dimensions, well that you also have to write down, and the metric, metric in three plus one dimensions is connected to the initial metric we had by some scaling factor. Anyway, you can do that algebra, and you find this is the metric, and then there's a scalar field. And the scalar field just has a normal action. So even though I go, uh, if I have one extra dimension, uh, the extra dimension I can forget about and think of its size as giving a scalar. And then I just have three plus one dimensional physics with a normal Lagrangian, a four dimensional Lagrangian now, and a scalar field. It's just a normal proper Lagrangian with the correct sign for everything. I also have, can find out the stress tensor for the scalar field now. This is the normal formula for the stress tensor of a scalar field. And if you work it out for the solution we had, now we had a particular solution. And in this solution, the size of the compact dimension is actually changing. Can you see that? So in fact, the, the scalar will have some gradients. And so it will have a stress tensor. And let's find out the stress tensor. Because there's something funny happening here. The size is actually going to zero. If it is going to zero, uh, the value of phi itself <laughs> is actually going to minus infinity. So just didn't do this correctly. Yeah. Phi is actually going to minus infinity. There's something singular happening in terms of phi, but uh, let's compute the value of the stress tensor. The stress tensor turns out to be diagonal, and diagonal stress tensor has the energy density and the pressures. And in fact, all the components are the same up to the, having these signs. And this function is here. OK, so let's see what we read. The size of the compact dimension is actually shrinking. So near r equal to r naught, let's see if there's anything funny about the stress tensor that we are seeing. And in fact, the stress tensor is actually diverging. In fact, the energy density is diverging. The pressures are diverging. Completely crazy things are happening there. So what would, would Bukhdal say? Bukhdal will say when you reach the, this place in the geometry, your energy density and pressure have both diverged. I don't want the solution. This is a bad solution. Let's throw it away. But is it a bad solution? Actually, no. In the full five-dimensional space-time, this is a completely smooth solution. So in fact, this is the magic of how all the fuzzballs work. If you try to dimensionally reduce them to three plus one dimensions, they will all look singular. But if you look at what they look like in 10 dimensions, they're all completely regular. Okay? And so what happens is that in the higher dimensional space-time, you'll get some topology, like the kaluza clan monopoles and so on that I mentioned. There's a topological twist somewhere. If you dimensionally reduce it, it just looks singular. But in the full space-time, it's going to be actually completely smooth, and that's the actual nature of geometry, and that guy doesn't collapse. Well, it doesn't collapse because of what? You can see there's energy here, right? In the from three plus one dimensional point of view, there was a positive energy density everywhere. The row was positive. But why doesn't it collapse? Well, if there's a place where the pressure is also going to infinity, that can hold it up. But you say, hey, pressure going to infinity, something is wrong, and it's not. So this is how the Bukdal theorem actually gets bypassed. There's nothing wrong with the theorem as such, but it was a theorem just in three plus one dimensions. But when you have higher dimensional solutions which are smooth in higher dimensions, you dimensionally reduce, well, you, you get something apparently singular by Bukdal's theorem, but actually fine. Okay. So anyway, that's just all I want to tell you about first balls, but I'll just use this as a picture now to go into quoted discussions of what I think should happen with first balls. This was the technical part I was telling you, but from here onward, if you just want to keep some mental picture of a first ball, you can just imagine you just make a little hole in space time, you take the compact dimension and shrink them as you go there, and okay, you made a little topological bubble in space time, and you can make another bubble here, another bubble here, another bubble here, and okay, that, that's your that's your first ball. So just keep that picture in mind, and this guy holds itself together. This is actually a solution of Einstein's equations. It doesn't collapse, it's actually stable. You can, you can do this, you can vibrate, it won't collapse. So uh, that's a typical first ball that you can just keep.
Okay, so as we said, what happened to Bugdahl's theorem? The pressure does diverge, but actually the full uh, manifold is smooth, so there's nothing for you to actually worry about. Okay, so let's see if we can now go back and do Hawking radiation, because if we can also understand the Hawking radiation, then, uh, well, that was the key to everything. So I'm going to take one of these simple, one of these solutions that we knew, and uh, try to see if we can get Hawking radiation from it. Let's recall a difficulty with the information paradox. At weak coupling, we had a nice picture. We even computed the fact that if you have vibration going at both directions on the string, they can collide and come out, and we had a calculation of the radiation rate, and the weak coupling radiation rate we computed from this actually agreed with the Hawking radiation rate down to every last 2 and pi. But the funny thing was here, of course, there's no information loss. The information of these spins and energies just comes out in this guy's spins and energies. But here, that wasn't the case. So if the mechanism didn't change between weak and strong coupling, we were in trouble. But now we know more, because now we can take one of these states and actually see what it looks like at strong coupling. It actually never has a horizon. It has some kind of a cap over here. So we got to go and see how that cap radiates. And when that cap radiates, we can now make, we get a different cap for every state. So now for every state, we have a different guy there, no horizon, just a different shaped cap for every guy, and every guy radiates differently, and should carry the information of the cap, which is the information of the state. And let's see how for simple states, we can do this whole thing completely. So as we said, we look at a state where we have all the strings the same, and we put the same kind of vibrations up and down on all the strings, and now they can collide. Say, for example, for this string, the left and right was collided, they came off, and the string is now empty. Okay, so this is the radiation process, which in the CFT we can calculate completely. It's a lengthy calculation, but you can do it completely and explicitly. You know the CFT state, anything you want, you can actually do with that. For this particular state, we also know the geometry has strong coupling. Uh, it doesn't have a horizon, it sort of has a cap, but it also has an ergo region. And if you want to see the geometry, I don't want to really look at it, I just put there to tell you that you can do it. It was done by these people. Uh, this is called a J-bar geometry based on this name, J-M-A-R-T, J-bar geometry. And so here's the whole solution. So you know everything that there is to know about this guy. Okay, you know the CFT state, you know the gravity state. All you want to know is how does emission happen from this gravity state? If you know that, you know how emission happens from at least one of the D1, D5 non-extremal D1, D5 P states, and then you're good. Yes? Um, this is completely smooth? This one is completely smooth. Yeah, there are no things like it. If you have a dimensional reducer, it will look singular. But as a 10-dimensional solution, it's completely smooth. Exactly, the same problem. Yeah. OK, so as we said, in every statistical system, if you take random excitations, uh, you will get random, each macrostrip will emit differently. So the radiation rate in the CFT, we had had this on the slide last time, is given by some emission vertex. Uh, this should be a mod square. And then you put the flux of the left movers times the flux of the right movers. So how much flux should I put for the left movers and the right movers on the string? Well, I, if I put them as thermal distributions, the Bose and Fermi for the Bose and then fermions, then I reproduce the Hawking radiation rate, which I find from the black hole. That's what we saw last time. Because that's a generic state to take, put them in thermal distributions, because they have the most entropy. Well, right now, we're sort of doing the opposite. We're taking a particular state, so the same calculation, I take the same vertex, the coupling, but the occupation numbers of the flux are giving me the bottom the left movers and right movers are particular ones for the state, so I call them row left bar and row right bar. They're the occupation numbers for this particular microstate. So now because I've taken a particular one and made all the strings the same and put the same amount of energy on the left movers and the right movers for each of them, uh, the emission will be rather different from Hawking emission. Of course, I'm trying to go to a very specific kind of state, so it will be different from generic thing. But now you can see I made it more like a laser. Like in a black body radiation in this room, the, the energy is spread among all different frequencies. But if you look at the laser beam here, all the photons are in the same frequency, and that makes it very simple. So that's the analog of what I have here. These are all going to, all these guys are going to emit at the same frequency, so this will emit more like a laser. But that's fine. Once I can do the one where all the modes are in the same frequency, I can move to slightly more complicated states where they are split between two frequencies, they're between three fre frequencies, and then come back from there. Okay, so they are all uh, they're like a laser, and there are certain peculiarities about this radiation from this microstate. You can firstly compute the energies of radiation. As I said, the energies are peaked at some definite values, and these m and here are integers. You don't need to know what they are, but for the particular microstate I had given you, you get emission only at certain energies, and that's because I put definite energies for these guys and these guys on all the strings. So the em energy emitted when one this and one this collide is just the energy of this plus this, and so it's just some discrete levels. Is that okay? I've chosen it like that, just like a laser has you know, either red light or green light. Okay. The other funny thing about this is that the, uh, once it starts radiating, the rate of radiation actually increases exponentially. And why is that? That is because when the first pair here and here collide and they come out, they leave you with one string having no excitations on it. It's okay. When the next emission happens from this string, then 
another graviton comes out when these two collide, but now there are two strings which are empty. So these strings are like bosons, and if you had n bosons in a state and you create one more, that has a factor of root n plus one. And so when you, this is the amplitude, when you do the probability, there's a factor of n plus one. So if you have already emitted n particles, the emission of the n plus one is enhanced by a factor of n plus one. The same physics happens for lasers. So that's just when you put many particles in one mode, you have to be very careful with the occupation numbers. Anyway, so the uh, emission also increases exponentially in some way. But anyway, this is all to say that you can, there are two numbers to worry about. The real number which tells you the frequency of emission and the imaginary number E omega, which tells you the rate of growth of the emission rate. And that completely characterizes whatever you want to say about the emission. Okay, so this is a straightforward calculation. Now let's go to the gravity and see what's actually happening. So here there is an ergo region. And let's first understand what an ergo region is. So black holes, you know, have ergo regions like the Kerr black hole, but you don't need to have a black hole to have an ergo region. Even a highly spinning neutron star will actually have an ergo region. If something is spinning fast enough, it gives an ergo region. And let's just take a spinning star because that's more like what we have here. There is no horizon. If you have a spinning star and spinning fast enough, then because of frame dragging, the light cones in the vicinity actually get tilted. Far away, they are pretty much up. But as you come closer, they get tilted. They get tilted in such a way that you can't actually stand at one place. If you stand at one place, you'll be outside the light cone if I just stand here. You have to sort of co-rotate with this. The, the, if you have to be in the light cone, you're always going along the rotation. There's no horizon, by the way. You, have, you can correlate it like this in a spiral and slowly, slowly, slowly do this and come out, right? So you can come out, but you have to co-rotate there. You can't stand in one place. That's called an ergo region. Okay, so let's see what happens. If you actually have an ergo region, it also produces particle pairs. This has been known, known long ago. Uh, in fact, it's one of the precursors to Hawking's calculation, Pendo's discussion of what happens when you have ergo regions. So uh, if you have an ergo region, then if you put a quantum inside the ergo region, but rotating opposite to the direction of the ergo region. So you see, you, have, you can't stand in one place, so you obviously can't even go backwards, but going this direction of the light cone is going along with the rotation, going this line of the light cone is going as much opposite to the rotation as you can. Is that okay? So if I draw a photon like this, it's trying to go as much opposite as it can. So if you put a photon which is going as much opposite as it can, of course the photon costs some energy, but if it's going sort of opposite to the rotation, it partly cancels the rotation. So it reduces the rotation energy of the star. Okay, and because rotation energy goes like angular momentum squared, when you lower the j, the angular momentum of the star, the energy goes down. So as seen from infinity, a photon put, a graviton or any particle put along the opposite rotating direction actually has net negative energy. So you see the same physics that we had for black holes, if you can find a particle which has net negative energy as seen from infinity, you can have that as a negative, something else outside as the positive energy, and you can create the pair. And that's why ergo regions also create emissions, and you can see this pair being created. And in fact, these emissions actually grow exponentially. All this was known right from the 1960s and 70s. Okay, so here we actually have an ergo region which happened in the geometry. So with that, you have to do a calculation of ergo region emission. Let me not take you through the details of the calculation, but as just explain what you do. You take a, the, a graviton, it, you dimension reduce it to get a scalar field, you make an ansatz for the waves, and you have to solve the radial wave equation. Everything else you do is an for YLM uh, harmonics. And let's see what you get. The emission has a real part, which tells you what frequency you're emitting at, and an imaginary part, which tells you at what rate the emission rate is growing. Okay, so that's the two rates. And if you find the omega real and omega imaginary, actually these things exactly match the CFT values down to the last two and pi. So that's interesting. Now we can actually see for this very simple state what is actually happening on the gravity side and where the analog of Hawking radiation is coming out of. So just to see that in pictures, we took this very simple state and on the CFT side we just took all the strings like this, they collide and they keep emitting gravitons. On here we had this, the geometry of this strong coupling, it's just something with a cap in an ergo region and it also emits and the radiation rates exactly agree, so we know exactly what's happening. So for the simple state we can now solve everything and there is no horizon. There is no information loss. We can actually see how the particles are coming out. You produce a pair, one guy goes out, but the other guy just settles in the star. So when a rapidly rotating neutron star also does ergo region emission, one particle goes out, the other particle is hanging out in the star, bound, sitting like a normal wave in the star. And as the radiation proceeds and the rotation goes away, uh, that guy's energy is no longer negative as seen from infinity, and that guy can also float out. So it's very much like the piece of coal. So in a piece of coal, for example, initially, we had one particle going out and could be entangled with the atom which radiated that. The atom could be left as spin down and this was spin up and vice versa. But after some time, this atom also floats out like ash and then only these guys entangled with each other and this guy can disappear, there is no problem. 
And now we are seeing the same thing happening with the algorithm. You emit a pair, this guy goes out, but this guy just sitting there. If this guy stops rotating, later on if this guy wants, it can also come out. There was never any horizon and nothing was lost. Okay. So uh, this was for the simple case. And as I was drawing these pictures for you, if you take uh, some strings different from others, some are triply wound, some are doubly wound, then you break the symmetry. You no longer get something which is actually symmetric. But then you have some algorithms somewhere going one way and some algorithms somewhere else going the other way. They each emit, but it's not so much laser-like because now the energy is split over two or three different Fourier modes. Okay? So then the energy rate is a little lower, but spread over more frequencies. And we did this calculation exactly. We did this approximately, and we could see it's heading the right way. For generic states, when you completely mess it up, of course, we don't know how to do the calculation. But on this side, we know it exactly agrees with the Hawking radiation, the rate. And so here we just assume that when you go to generic states, it should also match the Hawking radiation. But of course, we cannot do the calculation. OK, so this is all I wanted to tell you about the Hawking radiation part. So let me just see if I can summarize this, this piece. Uh, all that happened was that we took a particular microstate out of all the three child microstates. We could actually find its dual geometry. If you take generic microstates, they actually emit like Hawking radiation. The numbers all agree. So why not take a specific one? Because we can actually calculate for each of them. And then for that specific one, we could make the geometry. There was no horizon. We saw how the emission happened, and there was no information. Okay, so if you assume the same picture works for all the other states also, even though we can't actually do the calculation, yeah, good. We actually, the uh, radiation from these fuzz balls are exactly like radiation from any piece of code. Okay, so that's all that I have told you about this. Okay, so now we have some conceptual questions to ask. So this was the sort of, if you like, the technical part. But now let's move on to some conceptual issues, which we have to uh, really come to grips with to understand what happened to all the paradoxes that we had with black holes. So the first one is, the black hole is so big, three kilometers radius for a solar mass black hole, curvature radius is so low at the horizon, how did you break the semi-classical approximation which said that you know, everything should just keep going in? You can make these fuzz balls, but if something is starting to collapse, a star is starting to collapse, why should it know there are any fuzz balls? It should go like in the computer if you put the whole thing, it should just keep going. Uh, how does it know the fuzz balls are going to come? So what breaks the semi-classical approximation at the horizon? So let's go back to the work of Bekenstein who told us that the entropy of a black hole is given by the surface area of the black hole measured in units of Planck length squared. And it tells you the black hole actually has a very big entropy, which is 10 to the power, it has actually 10 to the power 10 to the 144 states. So that's a huge entropy. It's much more than the entropy if you had the sun before it collapsed. So, so the sun has a much lower entropy than the black, black hole after it has formed. So there is something curious about black holes. They have a rather abnormally large number of states. This fact, of course, has been known from 1972, but now it's actually going to be useful to us. So consider a collapsing shell. It's coming towards this horizon. It hasn't yet crossed the horizon. As it approaches the horizon radius, you can find as a small amplitude for it to tunnel into one of the fuzzball states. I just drawn this rough cartoon for the fuzzball state because you know they had all these topological monopoles, anti-monopoles. Okay, I didn't know what to write down, so I just drew something there. It's just my fuzzball state. Okay, so this has some amplitude tunnel here, and how do you check that it can tunnel? You have to see if there's a topological path. Okay, and there is a path. So you can just look at this geometry here. It has monopoles and anti-monopoles, and there's an actual topological path to have something with no monopole, anti-monopole, to something which does have them, so you can look at the tunneling. So, but how do you estimate the action for tunneling, the amplitude for tunneling? There's a standard way to estimate the amplitude for tunneling. The amplitude for tunneling is e to the minus some classical action, and the classical action, of course, you have to find from the Einstein action. How do we estimate this? Let's just get some very crude estimate just to get started. And in all this, let's just put all the length scales to be of order, there's only one length scale in the problem, like we saw last time, it's just order gm. Okay, so let's put all length scales to order gm and see what we get for this Einstein action. So the volume of space, because all length and time directions are gm, that just gives you gm to the power four. The curvature scalar of Einstein, that has units of one over length squared. So that gives you this. There was one more g outside, and now I'm not going to worry about 16s and pi's. And so you find the action is uh, up to a factor of order unity, one power of g and two powers of m. Okay. So the probability of tunneling is will be given by the amplitude mod square, and so it will be e to the minus two times S tunnel. We can't do anything with the two right now because even this we didn't keep the factors of order unity. So let's just say the property of tunneling is some concept of order unity, and then there is a gm square. So that's a very small number actually, because if you do ask what is gm square, that's actually m over m Planck whole square. So it's e to the minus m over m Planck squared. m over m Planck, of course, is huge. It's 10 to the 40, so it's absolutely a very tiny amplitude tunnel into any one first ball. But now if you have many possible fuzz balls you can go to, just like in quantum field theory, if you can scatter into many final states, you have to sum over all the final states. So I have to multiply this by the number of possible fuzz balls I can tunnel to. 
And that's where the magic of the Bekestan entropy comes in because if I ask how many fuzz balls I can go to, it is exponential of the Bekestan entropy. That's A over 4G. The area is again GM squared. Okay. And then there's the G over here. And then if you just look at the numbers there, it's 4 pi and then GM squared. Since the number alpha was appropriate, you can now see that you can have a cancellation. And if this and this cancel, then the philosophy would be that the probability for tunneling into any one fuzz ball is quite small. But the probability for tunneling into any in the whole linear combination of fuzz balls can actually be order one because this guy can actually cancel this guy. So this doesn't happen for something like the sun. Because if you take something like the sun, then the size of the sun is maybe 100 times bigger or even a neutral star. The size of that would be 10 times bigger. So if in all the length scales here you put an extra factor of 10, then this tunneling amplitude will actually go down by a factor of 100. And since we're canceling two exponentials, if one exponential is 100 times larger than the other, you'll be completely squished out. But in fact, you can define a black hole now in reverse. The place where the, this tunneling into fuzz ball starts, you can start calling that the place where the horizon would have formed. There's really no horizon anywhere. But the physics changes at the place where the action for tunneling into any linear combination of fuzz balls, given there are so many fuzz balls, becomes, after being multiplied with the number of fuzz balls, becomes order one. So this is the new physics that we are now trying to uh, encounter here. Just one second. I just summarize and say that as this shell is collapsing, it has some amplitude to tunnel into any one fuzz balls. But that amplitude, of course, is small because a macroscopic guy tells you another macroscopic guy. Amplitude has to be actually ridiculously small. The only funny thing is the number of possible final states this time is ridiculously large. We know the Bekestan entropy is a very large number, much larger than the entropy of any normal object. And in fact, if you look at the scales, you find that it actually can trade off. So the small amplitude for tunneling, which you always completely ignore for normal macroscopic objects like stellar objects, in this case, you can't because the number of possible final states can cancel the number of small amplitude for tunneling. There was a question there. So would you say that fuzz ball formation is inevitable in spin theory? I think so, but that, so this was a model to, as to how it could happen. I'm just trying to see how it can happen. But the fact is inevitable in string theory for that, I would say, I would go back to the small correction theorem. Because if you cannot have remnants in string theory, which we talked about, if even one of the states actually created a horizon, you are finished because you could use that state and use it to create pairs. The small corrections can't save you. And you will have entanglement entropy, which is growing and growing. In fact, you can then keep feeding the black hole, letting it evaporate, feeding it, letting it evaporate. You can make the entanglement as big as you want between the outside and the inside. And we know in string theory, there are only finitely many states possible. Because with ADS CFT, you know there are no more than s s 10 states there. So even if one state actually made a horizon, you can't save yourself. So from the other rest of the background, we know that that's what I actually need. These are more like what I think should happen. With this, of course, you can't prove anything because it's just a crude estimate. OK, so here the physics is like this. If you take some kind of a box and you have a wave function in that box, and you have a very small amplitude tunnel into some neighboring box, maybe the small amplitude for me to tunnel through this wall, and through this wall, and through the roof, and through the floor. But there are many, many boxes, e to the s boxes. And the tunneling to go into any one, the property was, let's say, only 1%. But there were 100 boxes. Then overall, if you leave this wave function here, in a time of order unity, the wave function will disappear from there and become a linear combination of all these guys. Right? So we normally don't encounter that in normal physics because we have only a few directions to tunnel to. But if you have a lot of directions to tunnel to, then the small property of tunneling can be canceled against the large number of things you can go to. And this thing is not stable. It may look like it's in a tight box, but it will actually just not stay there. It will disappear, disappear immediately. So there was some more progress in this after that. It was just a crude estimate from 2008, which I had made. But then in something in 2015, we used some arguments of uh, early arguments of Cross and Wilczek to argue these two exponentials actually exactly cancel. The value of alpha is 4 pi, and they cancel. So there were some indirect arguments there. If you like, you can take a look at those. For some simple families of fuzzball microstates, this kind of tunneling has been explicitly calculated. And the important thing is what we, we call this entropy-enhanced tunneling. Tunneling is always there, but it's enhanced here because the entropy is so big. So it's just entropy-enhanced tunneling, so it becomes an important effect for this purpose. And these guys actually saw that this entropy enhancement was actually happening for a specific family of states. Okay. So again, these are just indications. They're not a complete proof of anything yet. But I think this picture at least holds together. So the moral lesson I would like to extract from this, maybe I can state like this. If you normally look in the path integral formalism, you have a measure term. If you're doing gravity, you have a measure sum over all metrics. right? And then there's a term which is e to the 1 over h bar and some classical action. So in normal physics, if you just want to go to uh, classical things, h bar is small. You extremize this, and the measure is order h bar, and you completely forget about the measure. That's how you get the classical limit. And that's how the semi-classical physics is done. And if you did that, the horizon would appear to be a place where nothing is happening. But if you go to the black hole, let's ask what the measure is doing. 
The measure counts the number of states that are, can possibly interfere in the process, all the states and the relevant energy that you have. And then you find the measure for the black hole is actually very big. In fact, the measure term is exactly comparable to this action. If you see where all the edge bars go, the entropy for the black hole is very big because there's somehow one over edge bar in the denominator. And so in fact, the measure becomes actually the same order as the classical action, rather than h bar suppressed compared to the classical action. And so now you cannot get the semi-classical physics by extremizing this anymore and ignoring the measure. The whole black hole is not a semi-classical object. New physics starts at the scale where all these new states become accessible, and that's basically what broke the semi-classical approximation. So if you are ignoring some states, you can ignore them only until the time they start bothering you. So as this shell was coming in, far away you could ignore the first balls, but at some place there were so many of them, you couldn't ignore them, and your wave function from the shell, it leaked into the fuzz ball space of fuzz balls. If your wave function leaks out into something else, you can't follow the collapse of fuzz balls, the shell to be inside and inside. And I think that's what took, uh, made it break into fuzz balls at the time it reached the horizon scale. Okay, so that's just a picture. And I just want to make the picture a little more concrete for reasons which we'll see later. So here's my shell coming in. As it starts coming close to this, its horizon, where it would have tried to go through the horizon, it starts leaking out, it starts making some of these bubbles. So you see these bubbles are like the picture I had given you as a way to understand fuzz balls before, right? You cut a little hole in space time, the compact direction comes and pinches off the toy model we had for a fuzz ball. So I could make a bubble here, a bubble here, and so on. So a little bit of these bubbles start forming, a little bit of the amplitude starts leaking into those bubbles, just because there are so many bubbles possible. So, so there's some probability to make those bubbles, okay? And then because you make these bubbles and the bubbles cost energy, now, some of the energy of the shell has leaked into these bubbles, so it has a little less energy as bef than before. If it has a little less energy than before, the horizon is a little bit further in than initially. Okay? So now, the horizon I have drawn a little bit more in than initially, and so the shell has to go a little bit more before it approaches the horizon. But by the time it comes to that place, it actually makes a few more bubbles, because the bubbles have become cheap there, and the actual horizon moves further in. And so it actually never catches up with this horizon. It just keeps making more and more bubbles. And in the end, it just reaches with no energy there. And all the energy just goes into the bubbles. And if you look at any of these uh, you know, three charge states which are made by the Bina and Warner, all these people, roughly speaking, they look like a lot of these bubbles with a uh, lot of things joined around. So they don't actually have to look like this, all the states. I'm just giving you a rough picture of what would happen. So you, you have so much phase space for creating these bubbles that as you go in, your energy keeps leaking into the bubbles. And you never actually uh, reach the threshold where you make a horizon. OK, so let's see if we have all this picture. Uh, what does it tell us about something which is very deep, I think, which I will call the causality paradox. So I want to talk to you about some things to do with causality and non-locality. Because a lot of the approaches to solving black holes which are different from fuzzballs, in fact, alternatives to fuzzballs that people propose, they all involve some kind of non-locality. Okay? So I'm a little worried about that. Because I want to give you some arguments. Of course, you can always say we don't really know quantum gravity very well, so we really cannot say what kind of non-locality there will be or will not be. And that's fair. But I want to give you some reasons where, for which when I try to struggle with non-locality, I finally came to the conclusion that it's not there. Okay, so I'll just try to give you my arguments, and you don't have to accept them. But I'll tell you what I was looking for for non-locality and why I didn't find it. So I call this the causality problem for black holes. We've so far talked about the entanglement problem, which Hawking found with all this. But of course, there's an even simpler problem, which was evident right from the beginning, that if you have a shell and it goes into the horizon, then here the light cones turn over. And if nothing can propagate faster than light, then the information of this shell can never come out. Okay, in fact, that's why it was called the information paradox. Right? Whatever made the black hole, how will it come out? Because the light cones have turned inwards and nothing can come out. So even forget the pair production, if you just have uh, this uh, this thing, it can never come out. And then if by pair production, the information is coming out, then you have further troubles. But can this thing ever come out because the light codes have gone in? And can we say anything about this? So firstly, people might think that in quantum gravity, maybe there is no strict notion of causality. So even at the perturbative level, let's start worrying about it. So let's first worry about perturbative quantum gravity. In flat space, the light codes just point like this, straight. So time is up, space is here. Everywhere, the light code is the same way. But if you have quantum fluctuations, Let's say some h mu fluctuation, you know, some fluctuation of the metric happening because of just ground state vibrations. Then these light cones vibrate a little bit, right? So then you might think that because of quantum fluctuations, maybe I can actually send information from here to here a little bit outside the light cone because once in a while they'll fluctuate a little bit so that they might be inside and I can just get there. It looks plausible, right? So you might think that there would be no strict notion of causality once you take into account even perturbative quantum fluctuations. But that's not true. Quite amazingly, even after you quantize gravity, 
Yeah, we are still doing it at a perturbative level and so on. So the light cones are fluctuating because when you add a graviton, it fluctuates, the light cones. You actually still have causality. And what is the reason for that? You can actually can quantize the graviton. It just is quantized almost like a scalar field or a vector field. And if you look at the causal propagators, the retarded propagators, they actually stay within the light cone. So because of analyticity properties of the Green's function, in the end, you actually do not get any propagators that leak outside the light cone. So just pictorially, you might have thought there'll be a small leakage outside the light cone, but amazingly, there isn't. Okay, so some other thing wants to preserve causality. And then you might say, okay, let's go to non-perturbative quantum gravity. Okay, there we have things like, let's take the, something very non-perturbative, and there there might be a violation of causality. Do we know anything in very non-perturbative quantum gravity? Well, this is some of a bubble nucleation. So you can have a universe which is, has a true vacuum here, and there's a small bubble of false vacuum, and the bubble expands and expands, and uh, you know, finally everything will become the true vacuum. Okay, bubble nucleation is a very, very quantum gravity process. You can imagine that. Okay. And in this also, you find that the surface of the bubble is actually never moving faster than the speed of light. So I tried to look at various processes, whatever we knew about quantum gravity, perturbative, non-perturbative, and so on, but I actually couldn't find anywhere you actually went outside the light cones. So let's see, it's because so even though you might think that quantum gravity, everything is fluctuating. So let's see if we can really isolate a notion of causality. And in string theory, you might think a string is a long object, right? So you might think that if a string is, let's say, a meter long, you have non-locality over a meter. It's not true. Because you take a string like this, if I vibrate one end of the string, you know, the wave propagates and excites the other end only at a speed which is less than the speed of light. Okay, so it travels along the string at the speed of light and the string is bent, it reaches at less than the speed of light to the other end. There is nothing known in string theory which goes out to the light cone. There's no calculation I know which allows you to send a signal out to the light cone using all the perturbative, non-perturbative parts of string theory like d brains. you put whatever you like. We have never been able to go out to the light cone. So it's a little difficult to imagine that we should go. So let's go and see what we can really say about causality. Now if you take a generic state in a quantum gravity theory, it will be hard to define the notion of causality because you have many manifolds which are being superposed. You write a wave function down of all the three geometries and each of them, the, the wave function, light cones are different. So which light cones will you use to define causality? There's no preferred light cone. Every manifold in this has its own light cone. Okay. So, uh, so how will you ever get any causality? So for general states, there will be no well-defined notion of causality. And I think that we have to agree with just from the nature of things. But uh, I think the following notion is true for even in string theory, and any theory of quantum gravity, I think it should be true. You take a space which has a maximal symmetry group, like Minkowski space or De Sitter space. I just took Minkowski space here. Okay. And assume the quantum vacuum state also has these symmetries. So take a Lorentz invariant vacuum in flat space. It has quantum fluctuations now, but I have taken the vacuum for flat space. Then, in the full quantum gravity theory, there will be a definition of local operators and a notion of causality, so that these operators actually commute outside the light cone, where the light cones are actually defined with respect to the starting metric, which didn't have any fluctuations. So let's see what I'm trying to say here. If I take this room, it's in the Minkowski vacuum, and so the, the metric is flat, and the vacuum is also the one corresponding to the flat one. I can define local operators at different points, so that even if I take all orders of string theory and quantum gravity and everything into account, perturbative, non-perturbative, I actually cannot send a signal outside the light cone which is defined before any fluctuations are taken. So everything I know in string theory is actually consistent with that. Okay? So in that sense, if you at least have a region which has a well-defined like flat space region or some place which has maximal symmetry and you're in the vacuum state there, you do have a notion of causality. Let's assume this for the moment simply because I don't know how to violate any example. And if the space is gently curved, we should at least get approximate locality. If it's curved in some way, as we said, we can't have exact locality, but let's assume we have some kind of approximate locality. So the region used in Hawking is gently curved, but that will give us small leakage of wave function out of the light cone because now we can't have exact locality. But that can't really help us for solve the information problem because of small corrections theorem. If you make small corrections to the Hawking emission, we already said it can't help us. So that won't really help us. If you assume order non-unity, order unity effects of non-local <laughs> physics, you can do that. I just haven't seen it happen anywhere. But if you assume that you can have non-local physics, then actually there was no information problem in the first place. You could take the information center and just put it outside. Right? So if you the information paradox only happens because you assume you can't go outside the light cone. Otherwise, you insert the black cone, just pick it up and put it there, and then it can just leave. Okay. So anyway, this is just my take on what uh, locality should mean, and now let's see what, what it means. Because all the arguments that have, the other models that have been made, and one should, of course, respect all the approaches to the black hole problem, because it's a big problem. 
but they involve some kind of non-local physics, just on the scale of the horizon scale, like scale M, for just for lo local modes, for low energy modes, getting had a model of non-locality. Uh, if you want non-local effect on the scale where the Hawking relation goes, which is the distance of order M cubed, uh, Malson and Saskia had a picture where you had wormholes connecting these in some way, and uh, Papadopoulos and Rajiv do a similar picture where the bits here are not independent of the bits here. So I would just call that non-locality on the scale of the distance between the hole and the radiation, like order m cubed. You can have non-local effects all the way to infinity, which was looks like to me like what Hawking, Perry, and Stromji were trying to say, that different amounts of infinity could hold some states. So you can have lots of non-local effects, but you have to come back and ask this question. We were collecting some questions to ask for any theory. If you want to put in some non-locality, can you actually show some calculation in string theory where you see a hint, doesn't have to even be order one, but you see some effect which is taking you out to the light cone. And I'm just saying that I haven't found one. Okay. okay, so now let's see how we resolve the causality paradox in first balls. And that will actually teach us something very important. And in the end, I will use that to actually come to uh, the firewall problem and say something about that. So let's ask how the causality problem is avoided in the first ball paradigm. So what is the causality problem? So let's say here, here is our, uh, that r equals 2m, and then here is uh, a small radius outside, which I can maybe say the size of the fuzzball goes to a few plank lengths outside that. So this is, if you had to draw a stretched horizon, you could say it is here. And now suppose a shell of mass m prime is falling onto this guy. I'm going to show you what the causality problem would be. So when the shell keeps coming closer and closer, it reaches a radius two times m plus m prime. At that point, a new horizon should form because with mass m and m prime, the actual horizon moves out here. Is that okay? So when it reaches this radius two times m plus m prime, if the shell crosses here, it will be inside its horizon. Okay. If the shell, if, if it comes here and crosses inside here, I have a problem. I'm inside the horizon. The light cones turn over, and I can't get out. But at this point, in the picture of first ball, which I was giving you. Because now I have enough energy, my total energy in this entire region is m plus m prime, I can now tunnel into fuzz balls whose mass is m plus m prime. Those fuzz balls have a radius which is this big. So as I reach here, this guy starts tunneling into fuzz balls, and then the horizon moves further inside because I leak some energy. They start tunneling into more fuzz balls, the horizon moves inside, but well, that's the picture I've already shown you. So now you can see why I was drawing the picture. As the shell keeps coming in, it starts leaking energy into fuzz ball modes because if it wants, crossed its own horizon, light cones turn over, then nothing in string theory which can actually ever get you out. So you've got to keep leaking your energy as you approach the horizon. The horizon has to keep receding in front of you, because otherwise I don't know how to solve the problem. Okay. So this is the picture which I, which I think uh, should tell you how the, how the fuzz balls form. And at this point, as we said, you can tunnel into fuzz balls because they're accessible. But now you can ask a basic question. Yes, at this point the fuzz balls are accessible, and so you can tunnel into them. But what local property of the space-time here tells you, well, here the fuzz balls are, just go into them. This is the really basic problem people have always had with the black hole puzzle. As I start falling into some radius where I'm passing the horizon radius, what happens at that place to tell me that this is not an ordinary piece of space-time if the whole shell was made of lots of particles? If you just use the equivalence principle to say every particle is moving through a normal piece of space-time, it would keep going in. So who tells the guys that something special is happening here tunnel to fuzz balls and, and do something, don't just keep going in. Is there something local there which must happen, and what is that something? Okay. So actually, this is what we actually need. Is there any picture, any model we can find in all of physics for space time, where the low energy matter state see nothing special at that place, but matter with energy more than a given threshold sees a different physics? So you see that if the particle shell falling in had a very low mass, it could keep going till it made a horizon somewhere here. If the shell was heavy enough to have a mass m prime, it should do something here. So light particles should continue up to here, and heavy particles should stop here, even heavier particles should do something here, and so on. So if we don't just want the equivalence principle to fail, we want the equivalence principle to fail differently for different mass particles. Do we know any model anywhere in physics where a light object can pass through this room like this, but a heavy object gets stuck? Okay? If we can find a model for that, we want to see how to borrow that model and put it into this physics. And we can take a toy model, which actually came in string theory a long time ago. It's called a C equal to 1 matrix model. And it goes like this. You don't actually have to know this, because this might be before your time. It came in the late 80s. So if you just take an n cross n matrix and try to write a Lagrangian for the matrix, so all your elements are your entries, are just, your variables are just the entries of a matrix, you can write a Lagrangian for, the, for those entries. You can also put a potential if you like, and you just do this path integral. 
So you try to solve the quantum mechanics for the elements of a matrix. Okay. Well, it was actually exactly solved because the eigenvalues of the matrix actually behave like fermions, it was found. And if you are the lowest energy state of this, let's say with no potential, you just put the fermions one by one into a Fermi C, and this is the ground state for the full quantum theory, quantized by this path integral for the entries of an n cross n matrix. You can now forget the matrix. I was just giving you the history of it. You just have a Fermi C of eigenvalues. Let's just stick to that. But it actually came out of an exact string theory in, in one plus one dimension. So that's why I mentioned the connection here. Now you see something interesting is happening. If you make a little ripple on this Fermi C, it actually travels this way at, a, at the speed of light. Okay, this was actually done for the C equal to one matrix model, and it actually gave you strings in one plus one dimensions. This was called a massless particle. It actually has a wave equation of a massless particle. But if you make a big wave, it touches the bottom of the C, and actually does crazy things. It falls over and can no longer be described by a classical scalar field. Okay, so here we have a model. If space-time is not just a manifold, if it's just a manifold, you actually cannot solve this problem. If space-time has something which we haven't seen yet called a thickness or a depth, then we have a model for what we want, because then if sickness has a depth, particles with low energy see only the surface and they don't care how deep it is. Like if you're in the ocean, you won't care how deep it is. But if you take a wave which is sufficiently big with a lot of energy, you'll hit the bottom. And if the, if the wave was you know, not deep, you won't see it. So this is the kind of model uh, which we actually want. In fact, when you do the C equal to one model with the potential, I uh, put the potential zero right now, the potential actually looks like this, and the C does actually have a varying depth. And this is what we actually want to borrow for our black hole picture, this will be the surface where the fuzz balls want to form, the actual surface of the fuzz ball we have, and this is the, the analog of the Fermi C outside. We still have to ask where did the Fermi C come from, what is there, what's creating this depth, and we will answer that. But right now, if we have this picture, we can really see it help us, because here we'll have small particles, they can happily go, but if there was a big particle here, it would hit the, hit the bottom. And this wave, when it comes to some appropriate depth, when it hits the bottom, it makes a horizon here. A big wave will make a horizon here. And that's the only way we can actually get out of the problem, that look, locally nothing is happening. Okay, so now, how can we actually do this? Well, in our fuzzball paradigm, does something create, this is our fuzzball, does something create an effect out here which can get the effect of an effective varying depth C? That's what we are looking for. Well, certainly the fuzzball creates some different vacuum fluctuations here. You can emit a particle from this which can branch into more particles. These are virtual fluctuations, which if you just had empty space time, you wouldn't have them. So this is a fact. If we keep an object somewhere, and a different object, maybe a tiny dot in there, they will have different vacuum polarizations in any part of space time, in particular in this region here. And what I'm going to argue is these vacuum polarizations are different for the empty black hole and this. And so when you come to a normal piece of space time, you won't find these vacuum fluctuations. You'll just see nothing. And with those vacuum fluctuations that effectively create this varying depth for me see. Okay, so let's see how that can be. There are two questions to ask. What is the nature of these fluctuations? Why are we talking of these fluctuations? Because uh, you have to see which fluctuations you mean. But also you should ask, why should they be important? Vacuum fluctuations are normally a very small quantum effect. Why would you even care? Okay, we ask you to change the whole physics of the black hole, so why would we even care? Well, answer the question A. The fluctuation we have in mind, if this is our first ball, you can always fluctuate to a higher mass first ball. Just like when you make any virtual fluctuation, if this room was a vacuum, you create a proton-antiproton pair or electron-electron pair out of the vacuum, the energy goes up in the fluctuation, two times mc square. So you can fluctuate to a larger mass first ball and there's a larger mass first ball, okay? So the energy is still m, so it's a virtual fluctuation because you borrow energy from the vacuum, but once you have first balls, you can also fluctuate to larger first balls. Okay, those are the fluctuations I have in mind. But now you have to ask me, why is that important? I don't have this extra energy delta m, so your fluctuation should be very small or maybe ignorable. Well, what helps me is the same thing which helped me before. Why are these fluctuations important? Because they are so numerous. Because if I have a mass m plus delta m, the number of those possible fluctuations are e to the power s Bekenstein, the Bekenstein entropy at that particular mass. There are a huge number of them. We already canceled the smallness of a fluctuation against the number of them when we were solving the breaking of semi-classical problem. We don't want to introduce new physics, it's the same physics here, that the fluctuations can actually be very important, but they're still virtual. I don't have the mass m plus delta m. They are not real uh, first balls, I can't make them. But uh, uh, there are these virtual fluctuations, and now let's see what happens. So I can just look at this picture, and now if I have a shell coming in of mass m prime, out here it doesn't do much. As it comes here at this radius, if the shell had a mass delta m, at this point, these virtual fluctuations will have mass m from here and delta m from these guys, total mass m plus delta m. When the shell is here, my total available mass to me is actually m plus delta m. 
Well, now these guys, instead of being virtual, are on shell. So when the fuzzball comes here, it can actually start tunneling into these modes, and that's the picture that we had. So if the fuzzball is here, the virtual fluctuations extend around it to some distance, but they are virtual. But if I come within the domain of virtual fluctuations, well, now they become on shell because I brought extra energy in. And if I bring sufficient extra energy in at that point so that the virtual fluctuations there become on shell, I can then make them real fluctuations. And so that is the picture. You keep bringing shells of maybe heavier and heavier mass. Further and further out, they can make the virtual fuzzballs there into on-shell fuzzballs. They tunnel into them, and the physics changes. Okay? So what we have learned from this in pictures is that the normal picture of a black hole had nothing inside, but the outside was just in some also empty space, which you could write in Riddler coordinates called Riddler space, and something coming here would see the equivalence principle. Nothing would be happening. It would just go in, and nothing would happen here, and so on. But actually, we have learned something very different. The inside completely changes. It becomes the fuzzball. We saw that in explicit constructions. But actually, the outside is also different. It's different how its vacuum polarizations are not the same as the vacuum polarizations of space, which is far away, away from all objects. You have more fluctuations of virtual fuzzballs. And so you can call this not the Rinder space, but I just call it zero Rinder space. And when something is coming in, at the place where the energy of this plus the energy of this becomes equal to the fuzzballs which form at that level, it turns into fuzzballs. And at that place onwards, the equivalence principle breaks down because new degrees of freedom have been accessed. OK, and this then can solve the causality paradox. And this is the picture I put together. So you can see in this part of the, uh, of the talk, we are simply now putting pictures together because now we just have the basic fuzzball construction. We can't actually do concrete calculations to tunnel a generic in falling shell to a generic fuzzball state. That's just too hard for us, at least at this point. So now we just want to see if all the puzzles we had with the black holes can be put in some context, but at least they have plausible solutions. If any one of them does not, then the whole picture has to be thrown out of the window. Okay? But what I'm giving you so far, we go through one by one with all the problems that people had, and we can try to slowly build up a picture which is consistent to solve all those puzzles. OK, let's use this to now move over for the last part of this, which is a story uh, which led finally to the firewall argument. But the history of it before that, of course, was the story of complementarity. And we'll see that complementarity was first started long ago by Tuhuf and then Suskind. We have a slightly different version of that, which is called fuzzball complementarity. The firewall argument tried to shoot down this complementarity. And initially, they thought they could also shoot down fuzzball complementarity, but it turned out that was not correct. So in fact, in the, in the end, it turns out that you can have a kind of complementarity, which is this fuzzball complementarity. And there was actually a little hole in the AMPS argument. And I want to show you what that hole was. So let's begin at the beginning and learn the issues of complementarity. So when it began with the ideas of Tuft and Suskind, it was an interesting approach. The question they asked was, is it possible the interior of a black hole has some kind of new physics in it, different from the physics outside, which could help us to solve the puzzles associated to black holes? So what they say, take an infalling object to the black hole. This is the black hole horizon. And one plank outside that was called the stretched horizon. Okay, so I've drawn the stretched horizon in this kind of fuzzy form. And suppose what happens is the following. This is more like Suskind's picture of this, that two things happen. Firstly, the information of the infalling objects gets absorbed by the stretched horizon and radiated out uh, as thermally. So the information all returns here. So you're good. You haven't actually lost any information because the guy outside got it. But a second copy of that information actually continues to fall in. So I've also recovered the other part of my intuition that I should smoothly fall through the horizon. Well, normally you cannot duplicate things. This is called quantum cloning. And we know by quantum linearity that's not possible. But in this case, they conjecture this. Maybe this could be allowed. Because if you actually make two copies, one inside, one outside, it's hard to compare them. Because if something is inside and outside, how do you take it out to actually compare? You can jump in and compare, but you don't have enough time to compare. And so they did lots of those arguments to say that maybe you can't compare. So maybe I can have novel physics across the horizon where I really split things into two copies. OK, those were the initial ideas. And as starting ideas, they were very nice because they later on uh, had some impact. But as they stand, uh, they had some immediate problems. For example, you can first ask, what reflects this thing off here? There's nothing here. So why does this thing reflect off? There's no reason for that. And also, if you look at the good slicing, if you look at the complete slice of space time, if you look at them in a Penrose diagram, nothing special is actually happening at the horizon. So why should quantum cloning happen here and not in some slice through our galaxy? So for these reasons, if you just look at uh, you know, what any relativists thought about this, who have been thinking about the black hole problem, they did not take this idea of complementarity seriously. Uh, but people, some people in the string community were, of course, very interested. But 
I just mentioned that because if you're one of the relativists or anybody who does not take the initial postulate of complementarity seriously, then the far log argument also doesn't mean anything to you because what it does is it tries to give a rigorous proof that this idea does not work, that you could do this. Okay, so that was the goal of the firewall argument. But the firewall argument also got a little confused with certain other things. So I would first try to clarify what it was doing, and then I want to point to you where the little flaw in that was. So let's first also talk about what happens with first balls. Now here things are quite different because instead of having the black hole with pair production near the horizon, we actually don't have a, we actually have a surface here, which is radiation normally. So at least one part of it is not a problem for us. The fact that the thing scatters back out, well, that's already obvious with fuzz balls. We've actually seen it happening explicitly in the various uh, explicit models we had and so on. Okay. So we don't have any problem of, but can we have any notion of smooth infall? What about the other part? Can we fall in smoothly? Okay. Should we not already say that the fuzz ball will have to behave like a firewall? We've had these fuzz balls for you know, 20 years now. Why didn't we already say they behave like a firewall? When you hit the surface, you get burned, crushed, smothered, whatever you want, word you want to use. Uh, you can use that. If you already have a surface there, what's new to say that there should be a firewall there? Interestingly, the reason we didn't say it has to behave like a firewall, and some people did. For example, Yosef Bina always said, when you hit the surface of this, you will get crushed into lots of pieces. But there was always a second possibility, which at least I have tried to explore. We said that you could have a possible kind of complementarity, and to distinguish it from the other complementarity, let's just call it fuzzball complementarity. So what's the difference? We can't introduce any new physics. For us, all the physics has to come out of string theory, which is based on just local, completely covariant, nothing going outside the light cone, and explicit Lagrangian. You can't tamper with anything. Whatever has to happen, has to happen with the first ball as coming out of string theory. So I can't say inside the horizon I can have new physics where I can get quantum cloning. I don't have any of that. But let's see how we can possibly get complementarity. So a collapsing shell does turn into first balls. We said that. We saw there was the amplitude tunnel. But once it becomes a first ball, what happens after that? Well, there are lots and lots of fuzzballs. So in the whole space of fuzzballs, the fuzzball keeps evolving and changing its shape. Okay, the state of the fuzzball can keep changing. There are e to the s fuzzballs of the same mass. So you may initially make this fuzzball, but you know, it, it's going to keep changing and moving through the whole space of fuzzballs. What about that part of the evolution? We have to think about that. Well, so it'll keep changing through fuzzballs, right? The fuzzball will change shape. That's what I tried to draw here. Okay. So let's start to draw that pictorially. Each of these squares represents one state of the fuzz ball. This is the initial state which you land in when you turn it in, but there are other states for the fuzz balls. And you will start to first move into the fuzz balls which are closest to you, then the fuzz balls which are further away, and the fuzz balls which are further away. There's this whole other space of evolution that you now have to study. Okay, what should we call this space? We just use the word superspace. This is not the superspace of supersymmetry, but you know that people in gravity, they call the space of all gravity solutions as superspace. This is that superspace, right? So if you take the space of all solutions, well, most of them are fuzzball solutions. So the space of all fuzzball solutions, we'll call them superspace. And the full quantum gravity state is a wave functional over superspace. It'll give the amplitude of each of these configurations. And only then have you given me the actual wave functional in quantum gravity. OK, so this is just setting up notation. So really, as the fuzzball keeps evolving to the space of configurations, you can draw it like this. Your, your initial fuzzball was here, but then it keeps changing like this and keeps changing like this. You move in some kind of circular waves out into more and more complicated fuzzballs. OK, just a picture. But let's see what it can help us to do. So again, this evolution we said goes to this kind of evolution, going radially out. Suppose you can map this spreading into these uh, spherical wave fronts in this huge dimensional space into when you move to this circle, suppose we artificially say that it maps into a circle which is inside the horizon radius this big, and this circle is a circle this big. And after some time, when you run out of fuzz balls, the whole thing gets completely messed up anyway. There's no good smooth uh, even wave front here, and we say then it reaches a singularity. It's just a formal map. If something is spreading in rings out here, I could map them to these rings out here, and then I could say that out here I had shells, but once it came here, it just kept moving in the space of fuzz balls, not really going in. But I could approximately say that it's actually continuing on some path. And suppose I can map that path to look like this. Then I can ma map the outside path to at least approximately mimic something going in. This was the idea of first ball complementarity. And so what this is saying is that you really there's no inside of the black hole. Of course, just a first ball, there's nothing inside. It's just a mess. But you can have effective dynamics of that first ball, which mimics free infall. Now, this may look like a stretch. Why should complicated dynamics of a complicated object mimic free infall? But the idea here is based on something simple. It's actually based on what you see in ADS-CFT. If you just have some kind of normal piece of concrete and you fall onto it, you just get vibrations of the concrete. And if this was you, you just die. Okay, So uh, things break up. And you may call that a firewall if you like. But think of what happens if you fall onto a stack of ND3 brains 
where the reason n is a pretty big number. Take a graviton falling onto that, it just becomes lots of little open strings and becomes become a complex you know, bunch of open strings making a quark-gluon plasma or something there. And that circle then starts spreading. If your one graviton broke up into one million open strings, would you say the graviton has been burned, destroyed, shattered? Well, it looks like it. But on the one hand, it has broken into lots of open strings that you keep spreading here. But because the scattering is not random, it's just some, some kind of particular coherent state you got, which spreads into a bigger coherent state than a bigger coherent state, actually you can map this whole evolution of this spreading into bigger and bigger circles into the graviton continuing deeper and deeper into an anti of space-time. And now you see nothing seems to break at all. So something which is a very complicated evolution in one space can be mapped to a very simple evolution, effective evolution, where in reality the graviton just became open strings. This space really wasn't there when you look at it this way. But you can continue the space and imagine you are going in. So because this argument was there, we're never sure that you can really have to have a firewall when you hit the surface of a fuzzball. You hit the fuzzball, the thing you need to do this is that you have to have a very high density of states so that every frequency in the infalling graviton can map to some frequency here. It can be really absorbed. But you do have a high density of states. You have to e to the s Bekenstein states. So why wouldn't the same thing be able to happen with fuzzballs? And if it can, you see, you can effectively mimic free infall, which was what I was trying to do in the other picture. So why can't this work, and why can't this bypass any firewall argument? That's what we now have to go and ask ourselves. <coughs> so again, just to concretize the picture, because this is the picture we now have to fight against when we have the firewall argument, and we see the picture does hold together, and there's a hole in the firewall argument which allows the picture to hold. Okay. So again, this was the picture, but what you, one very important thing about it is that it only holds, which I had on this slide, as an approximation when the infalling energy of whatever shell comes in is much bigger than the temperature of the black hole. And the reason, reason for that is clear. When you have different fuzzballs, they actually all behave differently. They emit quanta of energies E of the order of T to carry their own information out. So different fuzzballs emit differently, and that's how the information comes out. We already said that. So energies E of the order of T, they all have to behave differently. How can they all behave like the standard black hole? If they all behave like this free infall, they'll all look the same. I'll be back to my information problem. The point is, if energy E is much bigger than T, we are saying that they can all behave approximately alike. So they are, it's not really like ADS-CFT, which is an exact duality. The picture here is a little different. You take a water droplet and another water droplet. If you look carefully under the microscope, they're a little bit different. Here the atoms could be here, here the atoms could be here. They radiate a little bit differently. If I hit it with a little hammer, they all have hydrodynamic waves, which will look the same on both of those drops. Right? So under large energy oscillations, two water drops look the same. That's what you do. But under delicate things, E of the order of T, they will look different. And I need that, of course, because otherwise my information would never come out. Okay? So under high impact things, they should actually look alike. And that's where I want my complementarity to work. So with that, at least we had a picture that shells come in, they turn into fuzzballs, and then evolution to the space of fuzzballs can mimic free infall, just like evolution ADS CFT. You become lots of open strings, but mimics infall into an ADS. Well, that looks like some kind of complementarity. Let's see if the AMPS argument can actually shoot it down. So let's first ask, what is the firewall argument? Because that's been a little confusing uh, to some people, so I just want to reproduce what it is. So first, let's go back to what Hawking told us in 1975. He told us if you have the vacuum at the horizon, which really comes from the no-head theorem, then you'll have a problem with the growing entanglement. Right? And then you cannot have unitarity. Okay. This is exactly equivalent to saying that if you assume, I'll call it assumption one, the entanglement does not keep rising but actually comes down, then at some point, then the horizon actually cannot be like a vacuum region. So you know, these are the same statement, because if A implies B, then not B implies not A. So we equally will say that what Hawking told us is that you don't, if you don't want the problem with increasing entanglement, but you want it to come down, then the horizon actually cannot be the vacuum. So then let's ask, what exactly are AMP saying? Because the horizon cannot be a vacuum is already what Hawking told us. And in fact, they use the same argument of bits and strong similarity that we used to actually make Hawking's argument rigorous in the small correctional theorem. So what actually is the difference between what Hawking is saying and the firewall argument? And I just want to make this precise because the AMP people were saying something extra, but that part usually got lost. And so a lot of people confused it with the Hawking argument itself. And so they couldn't find a smooth horizon, and then they came and said, look, this is a very difficult paradox to solve, but the difficulty was that they were trying to solve the information paradox, which of course is a 40-year-old difficult problem to solve. Right. So at this point, it looks exactly like the information paradox. So far, it's not different from Hawking. Actually, what AMS did was they added one extra assumption to this to try to make Hawking's argument stronger. But as we'll see, there's a problem with that assumption, and that's the loophole I was talking about. 
So they try to make the argument stronger by adding an extra assumption, I'll call it assumption two, that outside the stretched horizon, which is one Planck length away from the horizon, you just have normal physics, what they call effective field theory. Okay, so no funny quantum gravity effects here. A shell coming in at a speed of light, let's say, will encounter no new physics till it actually reaches the stretched horizon. Now at first this looks quite normal. If nothing happens outside the Planck lens from the horizon, good physics is there, we all would like to maybe think that. So then if a shell is coming in at a speed of light, of course wouldn't notice anything funny happening till it reaches the stretched horizon, and let's assume all physics there is normal physics that we are used to. That's assumption number two. Okay. And then they said, given these assumptions, the claim was, given assumptions one and two, and falling object will encounter quanta with really very high energy, reaching up to the Planck scale, when it comes really close here, and that's called the firewall. The intuition behind the AMS argument is simple. When you actually do pair creation in the Hawking picture, there's actually no energy stress to energy tensor there. You just have the vacuum. Because these are not real particles, they're just vacuum boards. Only when these vacuum boards come sufficiently far from the horizon, a distance like 4m or 6m, they become real particles. But if you actually had a hot surface there which is emitting, like in a fuzzball, then out here you get the same low energy modes. But if you follow those modes back and back, because the redshift, here they are much higher energy modes, but they're still real particles. So you can touch them, you can get burnt by them, and they are real particles. So this was AMP's intuition. If somebody replaces the black hole by a surface, then you can save your information problem because the surface can radiate. But now the radiated quanta there are actual real quanta, not quanta which only materialize out here, but just part of the vacuum here. If they are real quanta, you can touch them, feel them, get burnt by them. So they didn't try to make a construction of how the firewall will come. But I said, if you have a construction, in particular I said, if you have a fuzzball, won't that behave like a firewall? Because as you come close, you have a surface, you will get burnt by these quanta. That was the intuition, and it looks reasonable at first sight. Okay. But here is the problem with the AMS argument. These two assumptions actually are in conflict with each other. And so let's see how that is. So again, in step one, we said that they take the shell, we have a fuzzball of mass M, or, or just any you know, object which can radiate from its surface, it doesn't have to be a fuzzball, but some object here and a shell of mass M prime is falling in onto this. It's coming at a speed of light, it sees only normal physics, and that's assumption two. It sees nothing special till it gets all the way here, so in fact the shell passes this critical radius two M plus M prime with nothing happening, it comes in here. But now you see you have a problem because now you're trapped because the light cones have turned over here, and so it has to go through here because no new physics can happen here, and now when you're here the light cones have turned over, and now the information cannot come out. So if you assume that outside this region the physics is all normal, well then outside this region you can't travel outside the light cone. And if you can't travel outside the light cone here, whatever you might end up doing here, even if you could non-locally bring information out from here to here, you can certainly not take it out. So assumption one which told you that information has to come out, or the entanglement problem has to be solved, is incompatible with assumption two, which says that you actually will feel nothing till you get to the stretched horizon. And the reason they missed this was that they didn't actually worry about the mass of the infalling shell. They assumed it was a test object, for example. But if the shell had some mass, the new physics has to start at the radius two times m plus m prime. We were just talking about that in the last 20 minutes. If the new physics like tunneling into fuzzball doesn't happen at this radius, you are finished. Okay, so something new has to happen there. In the fuzzball paradigm, tunneling into fuzzballs happens when those fuzzballs become accessible and they have this size, so they're accessible there. But if you have nothing happening there, you are trapped, and if you are trapped inside your light cones, your information cannot come out, unless you say I'm going to violate causality and locality and everything, and then of course there's no puzzle, you can always take the information from inside and just put it out, then there was no Hawking puzzle. So that was the problem with the AMPS argument, that in fact, uh, and if you drop the assumption number two, that, uh, you know, that things can happen here, then you cannot prove that things get burnt, because out here the temperature is not hot. If you go away from the horizon, the temperature of the Hawking radiation actually drops very quickly. So one millimeter from the horizon, the Hawking wavelength, the radiation of the Hawking quanta is one millimeter, which is colder than the microwave background out there. So if the new shell forms a new horizon which is one millimeter away from the old horizon, there it's colder than outer space. So uh, the whole point was, you, you, new physics has to start before you get close enough to get burnt, because otherwise you are going to be causally trapped, and then you actually cannot get out. Assumption one, assume that you could get out, but assumption two prevents you from getting out. So that's the conflict with the assumptions. And now you can, if you want to go back and ask, Technically, where did they go wrong in all their arguments with bits and so on? That's here, and this is pretty much my last slide, so I'll, I'll end after this. That technical pro problem was here. The whole point was with first of all complementarity. We said the complementarity only works for energies bigger than kT. If the temperature of the black hole is, is of course very low, if you throw something of the, with energy E of the order of kT, there's no complementarity for that. But if I fall in my energy is a billion times kT, 
and then I should feel approximately to an approximation of one part in a billion that I can have first of all computer internet. Right? So when the actual argument go wrong in terms of bits and so on, the point is if something with energy E equal to let's say 10 kT falls in, energy much bigger than kT falls in, now there are more states for the system. Earlier you had a S of M, Bekesian entropy of M number of states. Now you have S of M plus E number of states. So number of states now is N final over N initial, number of states you have after the guy falls in, divided by the number of states you had before, is this divided by this. You can write it like this and this, just S plus delta S. So the extra states are E to the delta S, but change in entropy is E over KT, just from TDE equals, uh, TDS is DE. And if E is bigger than KT, this is much bigger than one. So when the new object falls in, you can actually end up creating new states. So if I fall in with energy 10 KT, the new black hole actually have a large number of new states, which are actually much more numerous than the old states it had. And the new states you create are actually not entangled with anybody. The old states could be maximally entangled with the outside of the, the halfway point and all that is true. But when something falls in, it actually always creates new states of its own. And those states are not entangled with anybody. And the evolution of those new states, which are actually captured in the first of all complementary evolution. So that was the actual uh, hole in the arguments to how you can get back with first of all complementarity. And I'm solely worried about quanta of the energy of E of the order of KT. But the moment you worry about the fact that you want complementarity for only for E much bigger than KT, you can actually approximate smooth infall and there is no problem. Now that doesn't mean you actually have smooth infall. I can't prove there's first of all complementarity. But because this possibility is always there, what you see is that you actually cannot make an AMPS kind of argument to argue that you won't have smooth infall for E much bigger than KT. In fact, I made an argument using a bit model with which, uh, which I put on 2015, the reference should be somewhere there. I made a bit model in this paper where you could actually realize first of all complementarity. So if you want to just for E much bigger than KT, you can actually make an explicit bit model that bypasses the AMPS argument, gives you smooth infall for E much bigger than KT, and the, all the information is emitted in E of the order of KT modes, and causality is maintained all through. So I think that's what I want to tell you about the AMPS argument. It was an interesting argument, it taught us a few things, but in the end it had this loophole that they did not worry enough about causality, and the re reason I mentioned it at this point was, I think in everything we are doing with black holes, we should always be very careful, do we want any leakage outside the light cone or not? If you d allow leakage outside the light cone, you can make lots of models of non-locality where the information can just come out, but we haven't found any evidence of leakage outside the light cone either in perturbative or non-perturbative or string theory or anywhere that I really know. So it's important to go and first ask if you really want to go outside the light cone. And if you don't, I think the whole picture of the whole black hole and how it forms and how the equilibrium spins feel violated has to be something like what I was presenting here. Okay, let me just put a summary of uh, all my talks here at this point. Uh, essentially, all we have said is this picture of the black hole wasn't right. It becomes a fuzzball and then radiates like a normal piece of coal. And if I had to give the entire summary in one line of what we have learned, the physics point is that normally we thought quantum gravity was confined to the Planck length, so nothing happened at the horizon. It's actually not true. Quantum gravity fails now in a second way. The first mode of failure, of course, we knew. If the curvature becomes Planck scale, semi-classical approximation fails. The second way that the semi-classical approximation fails, and that's when a very large number of uh, quanta are involved, a large number of quanta are involved, then uh, the size of bound states actually grows as some power of n times L Planck. So when many quanta are involved, we've actually seen these bound states growing in that fashion. And the scale of quantum gravity can actually jump from a microscopic scale to a microscopic scale. And that's what is the sort of the new lesson which we learned from here. And that's the lesson we can now take to other things like the early universe, the Big Bang, where again, large number of particles are coming together. So we may get you know, blotting out of the you know, physics all the way out of the scale of the cosmological horizon. And many interesting things may come in, uh, in for the Big Bang. And those are the kinds of things I'm thinking of now. And if somebody wants, they can certainly talk to me privately about that. I'll stop here. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, we have, so to speak, shown away the horizon uh, because the, the horizon is the source of the problems. Yes. Did you also show away the singularity inside the black hole? Yes, there is no singularity because once you enter into this generic fuzzball region, we don't find any particular place which is a singularity. For example, in the explicit models I was showing you, with that whole metric, uh, it was, there was no singularity in it.
Good. Yes, so you're saying if we don't deal with the black hole, but just deal with something else, then maybe we are not even talking about the black hole, but talking about some other things like neutron stars, and we're not addressing the interesting question like what happens with the black hole. But that's why actually I went to the first calculation of entropy. In string theory, we actually know what all the states are. Okay, because we can go from weak coupling to strong coupling, we can see all the states at weak coupling. Let us take the state, the case we can solve completely, the two-charge state. So there we know all the states, and for each of them, when we actually see what they do at strong coupling, we see none of them actually make a horizon. So what you do in string theory is you try to make all the states of a given mass, and you find that none of them actually have the horizon, they all swell up into this size. So it's not like you postulate that you don't have the black hole, you actually go and make all the bound states and you find none of them actually create a horizon or a singularity. That's the actual approach. So if you don't find the black hole in the theory, then that's the way the theory gets around the problem. It doesn't create the horizon. And the small correction theorem showed us that if it did create the horizon, actually there wasn't any way of solving the problem. Unless you have some kind of non-locality and so on, which I have not seen in string theory. So it's not like I was trying to ignore the black hole. We look at the, the bound state of string theory and we don't find the black hole. That's what happened here. Yes, please. Yes, you can choose any compactification. Nothing should depend upon that. That was first seen in all the calculations of entropy, like Stromanyi and Wafa worked with K3 cross T1, S1 compactification, and then uh, other people did Calabia compactifications, and the entropy number is always different, but it always depends on, but it's always the same between the you know, weak coupling and strong coupling. So the, it only matches the area entropy of the black hole, the microscopic count. So the actual prefactors, which could be 2 pi or 4 pi in the entropy, will be a little bit different depending on the compactification but the entropy from the counter states and the entropy from the area of the horizon will again match on both sides. And the same should be true with the first ball construction. For example, for the two charge, I was doing it for the case when the compact dimension was a torus, T4, but uh, Skenderis and Taylor then did it for the case where the compact dimension is K3, and it works equally well. So you can, it should work for absolutely for every case. And again, if it did not, the whole thing would, make, would, would break down and you would have a problem with the information problem. Absolutely. There was a question back there. Yes. Uh, so is there something like Brandenburger and Wafa? Did you say Brandenburger and Wafa? Yeah. Yeah, well, not exactly that. I think what is much more interesting is that as you go towards higher and higher densities, you get uh, something which is closer to a gas of black holes, which is showed up in the old work of Veneziano and also in the work of Banks and Fischler. Uh, so not so much Brandenburger Waffa because if you just take, they just use string theory, right? If you just take strings and vibrations of strings, actually you cannot really access the whole space of fuzzball. So you really know that you need to uh, put in the other brains and everything as well. And generally if you want to reach the black hole entropy, you need all the brains in there. And with all of them in there, uh, I think there's a very nice picture which, which seems to emerge where, again, when you put n particles together, get crushed near the Big Bang, the effective quantum gravity scales become as big as the horizon, and the real dynamics is then of how different horizon patches merge as the uh, universe expands. So that's the kind of thing I've been trying to think about. Like, essentially, how do the wave function superspace flow and merge when you join two fuzzball configurations close together? So we know many horizon patches merge as we grow because the horizon has to grow, and uh, there's an interesting dynamics that you can see, uh, again, qualitatively, uh, and not with, with numbers exactly. There's some picture which we can put together for how the early universe should behave. So that's the kind of things I was doing.